So for this week's clinical file, we have Sarah, and Sarah presents to physical therapy with a recent exacerbation of her rheumatoid arthritis. Which of the following interventions is the least recommended? So we have A, gentle isometrics in pain-free positions. B, contract, relax, stretching. C, grade one, grade two joint oscillations. And D is position changes every 20 to 30 minutes. All right, so when we come up to the top of this one, you got to be ready for rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis on the MPTE. I'm telling you, if I was going to prepare for anything, that's something that I'm taking for sure into the MPTE, that knowledge, that understanding, okay? So we got Sarah presents to physical therapy uh, with a recent exacerbation of her rheumatoid arthritis. Now, you know Coach K always got to break these things down. That way we're all on the same playing field, okay? Rheumatoid arthritis, this chronic autoimmune condition where it targets the synovial lining of the joints, right? And I mean, the body's just attacking these joints, y'all, to where it becomes not just painful. I'm sure you can imagine that's very painful, but it also just causes a lot of degradation of the joint, like breaks it down, makes it really nasty on the inside there, right? And so the the bones, but specifically the joints, you know, they, they just become very fragile, all right? And so we don't want to put a lot of load to them. Now, there was one thing about rheumatoid arthritis that's very special, and it's the fact that it's autoimmune, which you may know that a lot of autoimmune conditions kind of come and go. Like they flare up, then they get better, called remissions. Remissions is when it gets better. The exacerbations, that's when it's flaring up, getting worse, right? So rheumatoid arthritis is that back and forth, back and forth, get better, get worse, get better. So that is where we're at right now, a recent flare-up of her rheumatoid arthritis. Does this give you a better idea? All right. One thing I need you to write down on uh, in your notes right now is that rheumatoid arthritis tends to affect joints bilaterally. It's, so it's more of a symmetrical condition. It's systemic. But what I need you to write down in your notes is that rheumatoid arthritis tends to affect joints like the MTPs, metatarsal phalangeal joints, or the MCPs, metacarpal phalangeal joints. I mean, those are the, the major joints that get affected, also the wrist I mean, this is a big condition that affects a lot of joints, but those are some of the major ones that pop up in the text, all right? So as we continue down the question, it says, which of the following interventions is the least recommended? Now, I'll tell you right now, when people go through questions like this, you want to know where they mess up? They mess up when they miss this thing that says least recommended. They go down to the answer choices and, you know, they're all excited. They're like, yeah, I can get this one. And they wind up picking an answer choice that would be like most recommended because we're used to seeing things in a positive light when we're looking at questions. But remember, least recommended. It's important. One thing that Coach K always does is one of my strategies, my skills is I always make sure after I select an answer, I go back here and make sure that I selected the one that's the least recommended. Does that make sense? Are we all cool with that? All y'all that are live with me right now, let me know if that's cool. Put cool down in the comment box. If you're uh, driving down the street, just say it cool loud out, out loud and we'll be all good with that, okay? All right, let's look at the answer choices for those of you who are on the podcast right now. We got A, gentle isometrics in pain, free positions. We got B, which is contract, relax, stretching. We got C, which is grade one, two joint oscillations. And we got D, which is position changes every 20 to 30 minutes. Let's break these down by one by one. Remember, the patient is now in a recent exacerbation. Which of the following is least recommended? All right, let's look at A. A says gentle isometrics. All right, so we know that with isometrics, the muscle length is what? Is it changing? Ch not changing? You should be saying not changing, right? So this says gentle isometrics in pain-free positions. Can I do this? Is this appropriate for somebody with a recent exacerbation? Somebody in the acute phase? The answer to that is yes. All right, and actually, if you look in your Kishner and Colby textbook, it talks about rheumatoid arthritis and how to treat it. And it says there that we actually treat 
and a, a flare up of rheumatoid arthritis very similar to other acute conditions. So my question to you is, would you do gentle isometrics in pain-free positions? The answer to that is yes, you can do that in acute phase. But why do we do it? We do it because it allows us to really prevent things like muscle atrophy. So we're still activating the muscle and, and, and allowing it to maintain its current state without you know the atrophy that can come um, if you're not moving the muscle for a while or not contracting it. AKA, we're trying to avoid the muscle wasting away, okay? So the answer to this, or, or the way I'm looking at A is, yes, I can do it, and that means that I'm gonna put an X on it. It's not gonna be the right answer, why? Because I'm looking for the one that's the least recommended. Let's look at B. B says, contract, relax, stretching. You may have seen this uh, when you were looking at a lot of PNF techniques. Uh, this is a form of like PNF stretching where you can have the patient uh, contract the muscle, right? That you're trying to stretch and then you have them relax and then you stretch their muscle. So it, it's like uh, one of the major uh, examples of this is the hamstrings, right? You got your patient laying down on the plinth, right? Supine, and you're gonna do a hamstring stretch on the patient. Well, then you can ask with the patient with their leg up in the air, knee extended, hip flex, you ask the patient to contract their hamstrings and try to like bring the leg down towards the table, but you're like resisting it there, right? You're actually asking the muscle to contract, but then you ask the muscle or the person to relax the muscle, and then that's when you go into the stretching of it. All right. How many of y'all have ever done that before? How many of you ever tried this strategy before? It's very effective. But the question is, do I stretch tissue? when a patient's in the acute phase, regardless of the patient's condition? The answer to that is no. When a patient has an acute problem, we don't stretch the tissues around the joint. I mean, just, gen just generally speaking, we don't do that, but definitely not for rheumatoid arthritis. Why? Because that stretching also loads the joint. That stretching can also like damage the joint and cause a lot of compression and shear. Bottom line, do I want to do this? Absolutely not. This is looking like a great answer right now, but I'm not 100% sure. Hold on. Let's go through all of the answers first. Let's look at C. C says grade one, grade two joint oscillations. Can I do grade one, grade two joint oscillations? Well, let's talk about what that is first. We typically do these joint oscillations where we go to the joint and we're doing a very nice, um, uh, just gentle movement of the joint, regardless of whatever joint we're talking about, whether it's the shoulder, whether it's the finger or the, the proximal interphalangeal joints, the MCPs, whatever joint it is, we're gonna do a nice oscillation of that, that joint back and forth. Now, the one thing about grade one, grade two joint oscillations is we're not going to the end range. We're not stretching the capsule. We're not putting a lot of stress on the joint or even the tissues. It's nice, gentle motion. Why do we do it? Pain relief, pain modulation. That's the major, major reason why you would use it. My question for you, would I do something like this? Yes or no? Is this appropriate for somebody who's flared up right now? who's in the acute phase? The answer to that is absolutely freaking lutely all right? It's a pain modulation technique. Why not do it, all right? I like it. I'm gonna put an X on C for now because, we're, again, we're looking for the least recommended. Let's look at D. D says position changes every 20 to 30 minutes. Position changes every 20 to 30 minutes. And this, this kind of got a few people. Did you put D? I don't know if you put D, but this got a few people because they're like, hmm, do I want to do position changes sooner than that, later than that, 20 to 30 minutes? Well, I'll tell you right now, and this comes straight out of your Kishner and Colby textbook, that you want to make sure that the patient's doing position changes every 20 to 30 minutes. Why? Well, don't we want to prevent things like, you know, immobilization staying in the same position for a while? Because what does that do? Well, it can start with muscle atrophy, but one of the major things is that 
a patient who has rheumatoid arthritis is prone to a lot of stiffness and the stiffness breeds the pain, right? And so we don't want to have the patient sitting around in the same or laying in the same position for a long period of time because they get very stiff. Their joints start to lock up even more. They get tighter. That's not helping our patient from a lot of different perspectives. So do we wanna do position changes with our patient with rheumatoid arthritis, yes or no? The answer to that is absolutely I wanna do it. All right, I wanna get these patients moving and position changes every 20, 30 minutes sounds pretty god darn good to me. I'm gonna put an X on that answer because it's something I would do. Again, the question says, which of the following interventions is the least recommended? That leaves us with our final answer, definitely, B as in boy, contract, relax, stretching. I'm going to go ahead and super circle that right now. Yeah, that's the best answer there, okay? So when you are studying for the MPTE, two of the major pathologies that you have to know going into this exam is rheumatoid arthritis, understand the foundation well, um, understand what are things I want to do and not want to do with this patient population. But the other condition you need to know very well, does anybody know? What's the other major one? Like if you were going to go to the NPTE with just knowledge of two things, you better know rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. But most importantly, you better know how to differentiate the two. And so I want to congratulate those of you who got this question correct. But as always, I want to take you that step further. I want to do more for you. And so what I did was I took the time today actually over the past few days, and I, I just compiled the actual list of differentiating factors for rheumatoid versus osteoarthritis. I spent the time like, yes, you need to know this, you need to know this, and I put it into a nice chart for you. Sounds good? So for those of you on the podcast right now, I got that cheat sheet ready to go. Go into the show notes, whether you're on iTunes or Spotify, go in there, click the link in there, and get this cheat sheet. I'm telling you, it is fire.